everyone. Um, my name is Carolyn Bradley, and I work for FSU's Office of Research Development. Thank you for joining us today for a webinar on program evaluation. Many funding agencies require PIs to explain in their proposals how they plan to evaluate their research activities after the fact to measure for effectiveness and efficiency. Evaluation findings and other forms of assessment data are important for allowing for a solid understanding of what the PIs have actually accomplished and how their work might be approved upon in the future. In this panel session, we will be hearing from two FSU faculty members on this important topic of program evaluation. We are excited to have Drs. Janine Turner and Christine Moker here with us. Dr. Janine Turner is a professor in the um, Department of Educational Psychology and Learning Systems in the College of Education at FSU. She earned her master's in program evaluation and her PhD in educational psychology from the University of Texas at Austin. She joined the FSU faculty in 2004. Her research focuses on students' motivations and emotions while learning difficult content, as well as their use of cognitive and motivational self-regulation strategies. Dr. Christine Moker is an associate professor in the Department of Educational Leadership and Policy Studies in the College of Education at FSU. She is also a senior research associate with the Center for Post-Secondary Success. She earned her master's in administration planning and social policy from Harvard and her PhD in education leadership and policy from Vanderbilt. She joined the FSU faculty in 2017. Her research focuses on state and local policies supporting college readiness and success, she has conducted several large-scale evaluations for the U.S. Department of Education and the U.S. Department of Labor. So we're going to give Janine and Christine an opportunity to talk, and then we'll close with a question and answer section. Thank you, Janine and Christine, for being here. Janine, uh, we're going to let you start. Sure. So hello, um, I really appreciate you being here this after, well, I'm, I'm having trouble, oh, go to full, there it goes. Um, so I really appreciate your interest in program evaluation. Uh, when I was a graduate student at the University of Texas, I got a job at our local um, Austin Independent School District in their Office of Research and Evaluation. And I was really interested to see the practical application of research in evaluation. And our program offered a specific master's degree in it. So I got the master's. Um, and then since my initial work at the um, Austin Independent School District, I have conducted lots of evaluations for both small programs and large programs for the past 30 years. So today what I wanna do is to provide an overview of program evaluation. So to begin with, anytime you say that you're going to evaluate somebody, it kind of has negative connotations. Um, it, it just really makes people sweat and brings up all their bad memories about any kind of evaluation they had in school. So people are afraid of getting negative feedback. They're afraid of what will happen with the outcomes of the evaluation. I've even had people say, you aren't going to shut down my program, are you? No, of course, we're not going to do that. Uh, that's not the purpose of program evaluation. So program evaluation can be different from research. So in your research, um, you're almost almost trying to find statistically significant differences. And you use lots of different kinds of statistical analysis to provide that kind of evidence. But with evaluation, we use all kinds of evidence. And the difference usually is that evidence is always sort of tethered to or you know, related to programs intended outcomes and um, activities and goals. So when you do program evaluation, you usually try to answer three overarching questions. The first one is, were activities conducted as planned? The second is, is the project making progress toward their stated goals? And along with this question can come all different types of questions that could be related to progress. So were milestones met? 
were barriers to implementation detected? How can implementation be improved? And do we need to adjust the program goals, milestones, or maybe even the activities? And then finally, the last question is, what are the outcomes of the activities? So for the first key question, that's pretty straightforward. What I do as an evaluator is I read through the proposal and I, I highlight every single thing that the project says it will do. And I wanna be able to find evidence that it does what it says it's gonna do. So this is pretty straightforward. If you have specific activities documented, you develop training materials, you conducted specific trainings, or you provided specific services, all of that is documented and becomes the evidence that you did what you said you were going to do. The reason this question and answer is important is because it provides accountability for the funding agencies. I mean, people have provided you money and they want to know that they got their money's worth. And so this is the first level of evaluation to say, yes, the things that we said we were going to do, the things you paid for, they actually occurred. Then the second evaluation question, is the project making progress towards stated goals? This one can be a little bit tricky. Um, first off, when program developers develop their programs, they oftentimes have these really lofty goals that may not be very well defined and could be pretty vague. So for example, my project is going to reduce the dropout rate of high school students. Really, that's pretty big. Your little project's going to do all of that? Yeah, I mean, we may want to keep it closer to what the project can do. So, for example, these are three goals that a project I evaluated not too long ago had. First, this project will focus on expanding our capacity to train underrepresented students. Secondly, this project will expose students to multidisciplinary training in a specific content area by offering courses and research opportunities across two universities. Thirdly, while exposing students to multidisciplinary education, research, and leadership skills opportunities, this project can promote cross-disciplinary research collaboration among faculty members. Now, when I look at the, these goals, I have a lot of questions that start to jump out at me. Like, what do you mean you're gonna expand your capacity? What does that look like to you? And you're gonna expose students to multidisciplinary training and research at two universities. How is this gonna work? And then you bring in another thing with leadership skills opportunities in the third, and you say all of this stuff is going to relate to cross-disciplinary research collaboration among faculty members. Those are really vague lofty goals. And I have to really carefully read the proposal to try to find answers to my questions about their goals. And if I don't find really clear evidence of what these mean, then I have to sit down with the program directors and say, okay, what does this mean to you? What does it look like? How will you know that you've built, you know, expanded your capacity? And what happens when you expose students to training? What does that look like to you? So one of the things we talk about are SMART goals. And you want to try to develop you know, goals for your project that are very specific and measurable, achievable and realistic, and they are tied to time. When are these going to happen? And for larger projects, you also have to say how your different goals sort of interact with each other. So how does all of this relate to your ultimate goals? So starting off with really clear, specific, measurable goals will really help in your program evaluation and in defining your outcomes. So for this second evaluation question, is the project making progress towards stated goals and all of the different um, related sub questions? What we wanna do is conduct um, formative evaluation assessments. Formative evaluation assessments are ongoing and they happen like right after or right as something is happening. And there's lots of different ways we can gather information to see if you're making progress towards your goals. 
For example, I might observe your training. I might give surveys to participants that either have you know, selected response options or even some open-ended responses to get participants' feelings or perceptions or experiences about what they've just gone through. I may conduct focus groups or interviews um, to get data ongoing about what's going on with the project. When I go to design uh, formative evaluations, it's really helpful when the project has designed a very clear logic model or theory of action. And you can find a lot of information on the internet about these things and about how to do them and examples of them. I pulled this example because I thought it was, um, it, it helped, it was simple enough that we could see what it says, but it, and it's not too complicated, but at the same time, it clearly lays out, you know, what are the activities? And then I like that it has different levels of outcomes. So when I look at this, logic model. The people are trying, um, you know, they have the goal of um, giving parenting education, and they anticipate if they teach parents good parenting uh, strategies that they're going to have good outcomes. So on the far left side of this, you see inputs. And these are all of the resources that the project has. And many of these resources are paid for by the grant. Then for the outputs, these are the activities that the project is planning to do. So first they're going to develop a parenting education curriculum, and then they're gonna deliver a series of interactive sessions. And then they're also going to facilitate some support groups. And they have a targeted group of parents in mind that they wanna focus on. Now, out of all of this training and interactions, they anticipate that parents are going to increase their knowledge of child development. And this will give parents a better understanding of their own parenting style. And then through these activities, parents are gonna gain skills in effective parenting. And then that's going to lead to more intermediate outcomes of parents being able to identify and actually use effective parenting practices. And they anticipate that all of this is going to lead to improved um, parent-child relationships, which will provide strong families. Now, when I see this as an evaluator, every single box represents an opportunity for things to go very well or for things to unravel. For example, um, if something happens like COVID and you don't have enough staff to produce your training or develop your curriculum, then none of the outcomes are gonna happen. Then assuming that you develop your parent ed curriculum, if it's too complicated or uses words that your participants don't understand, none of the outcomes are gonna happen. If you do develop your parent ed curriculum, and then you, someone who delivers either the interactive sessions or whoever facilitates the support groups, if they don't make an emotional connection with the parents, if the parents don't trust um, the facilitators, then none of your outcomes are gonna happen. And you may have a specific target group that you wanna deliver this training to, but if you, recruit them and you even say you're going to pay them, if nobody shows up, none of the outcomes are going to happen. So from my perspective, you know, looking at this formative evaluation activities within these immediate activities is hugely important in order to assure that the outcomes you want to have happen are going to happen. So then when you get to the third key evaluation question, what were program outcomes? Now, this is where you may use high level statistical analysis. You wanna document the effectiveness of your activities. So you may use you know, statistical analysis, growth curve modeling, you know, all kinds of things. They're gonna demonstrate the effectiveness of your activities. And Dr. Moker is gonna explain some of those things. Now, all of this, results in usually a yearly evaluation report. And the yearly report is more summative compared to all of the smaller formative activities you've done throughout the year. So you're gonna present all of your program activities, 
you'll present your evaluation activities, and you can talk about the progress you've made and the evidence you have towards making goal making your goals. And then you can also justify the changes that you want to make because of the program evaluation findings. And then finally, you'll also provide in this yearly report, you know, additional outcomes such as dissemination activities. So what conference presentations did you give? What publications do you have that tell the world, you know, the good things that your program has produced? So in summary, I just want to say regarding formative and summative evaluation, formative evaluation is extremely important to make sure that your progress um, is adequate, uh, find problems, make changes. You know, program evaluation will tell you what's working well, but also what needs to be adjusted so you can make good decisions. The summative evaluation piece is going to document your program's outcomes, and you're going to uh, use, you know, evidence, statistical evidence that will, you know, demonstrate the successful implementation of your program. Um, I think that formative evaluation is hugely important, and that's where I like to focus my energy is trying to make the program the best that it can be. So in summary, I would say Robert Stake has written that when the cook tastes the soup, that's formative. When the guests taste the soup, that's summative. And so hopefully you can keep those, you know, both of those things have to happen. Keep them in mind. Don't be afraid of evaluation. Um, I hope that this overview has helped you understand program evaluation, hopefully reduce some of your fears. And if you have any questions, you are welcome to contact me. Thank you so much, Janine. That was a great quote. Sure. <laughs> um, Christine, would you share? Thank you. So that was a very helpful overview of um, program evaluation. And let's see, can you see my slides now? Great. Um, I'm going to be showing you some specific examples of program evaluations that were done as part of grants um, for various departments within the U.S. Department of Education. Um, so the first thing to consider is that different, different funding agencies can have very different requirements for what goes into an evaluation when you write the grant proposal. And in some cases, if it's part of a larger proposal where you are, it's, it's a brand new program that's being implemented, the evaluation might just be a few pages. So you might have very little space in order to convey what you plan to do in the evaluation part of the grant. But um, some common components can include an impact analysis, um, an implementation or a fidelity analysis, as well as a cost analysis. And cost analysis is something that over the past five years or so, the US Department of Education has been very interested in. So not just does it work, but how much does it cost if other places wanna replicate that program? Also the requirements for the rigor of the research design may also differ by funding agency or even within grants in a single agency. So some of them might want experimental uh, causal evidence, others might just be uh, satisfied with some descriptive evidence looking at progress towards goals. But some common types of designs that are typically used uh, to look at the impact of different policies and programs include experimental designs, regression discontinuity designs, interrupted time series designs, and matching. And I'm going to show you a few different examples of these, um, as well as some examples of implementation uh, studies and cost analysis studies that were done for several grants. So the first example is a study that looked at a Kentucky virtual schools hybrid program for algebra one for students who were taking a grade nine math course and looking at how that program impacted students' achievement in math. So this is kind of a very simple theory of action of what the program intended to do. So there was ongoing uh, professional development that was guided by instructional specialists for teachers of these hybrid algebra courses that were a mix of both online and face-to-face -face instruction that was intended to increase teachers' content knowledge and instructional practices, and then improve the use of instructional materials and activities, and then ultimately to increase student achievement and math course taking. And as part of that, the resources that went into it, there were some online resources as well as other resources uh, like an uh, online curricular program that were made available to teachers and to students. 
So for the impact analysis, this was an experimental design where there were 47 uh, different high schools and they were the whole school was randomly assigned to either a treatment uh, condition which participated in the hybrid algebra curriculum or a control condition, which was just business as usual, or where all students took a face-to-face -face algebra one class. And all teachers within a school were assigned to the same condition. And this was important because they didn't want one algebra teacher within the school saying, hey, this is a really great program, and then share it with other control teachers and have uh, contamination within the experimental design. So in this case, all of the teachers within the school were assigned to do the hybrid algebra method of instruction, or they were assigned to traditional face-to-face -face classes. And the sample of students for the study included all grade nine students that were taking algebra one. So this shows how the impact estimates were reported um, in, in the final report for this project. And um, if you look at the, the p-value sort of in the middle of this table here, um, you see that they're all greater than 0.05, indicating that there were no statistically significant and outcomes between uh, treatment students in the hybrid algebra program and comparison students in traditional hybrid algebra classes. And that was uh, for two different outcomes, looking at math achievement and then also the type of math course that they enrolled in 10th grade. The study also had a fidelity of implementation uh, component where there were different uh, scales that were created. Uh, with ranging from zero to uh, three. So the first one shows uh, teacher participation and professional developments. And a, a scale of zero would mean zero, the teacher did not attend any sessions. And a scale of three would be high participation where they attended eight to nine out of the 10 sessions over the summer. And then the second table here shows the rating uh, for school year professional development attendance. And again, it ranges from zero, did not attend any sessions, to a high rating of attended eight to nine sessions during the school year. And one thing that's important to point out here is that over 50% of teachers had no to low participation in professional development. And so this is really important for interpreting the effects that were found in the impact study, because uh, it seems that it could just be, we, we don't really know whether or not this program is effective or, or not. It could just be that teachers didn't really use it as intended, and so we didn't find any effect. And we don't know what would have happened if all teachers would have um, had high participation in the professional development and other activities. This is also looking at the extent to which students in the schools used the online algebra one material. And we see again here that over 50% of students had no to low use of online materials. And one of the things that we found when we were doing site visits at these schools was that the principal would have said, oh sure, my school is willing to participate in the study, but then there wasn't buy-in among the teachers who were participating. And so nobody was forcing the teachers to attend the professional development and they were not invested in the program. They weren't really interested in changing the way they were teaching their classes. And so they just decided not, not to participate, not to go to the professional development, not to use the online resources. And so this study is really an example of one that had poor implementation, uh, which is why it's, it's important to have this component of the evaluation looking at fidelity of implementation. The second example that I'll share with you is from, uh, it was an investing in innovation fund grant uh, through the US Department of Education that was given to a nonprofit organization called the Nicewanger Foundation, which worked together to create a Northeast Tennessee College and Career Ready Consortium. So this is a theory of action, and you can see this is much more detailed than some of the early examples that, that uh, we've seen in this presentation so far today, but it really provides a lot of detail of exactly what should be happening in this consortium as it was originally intended by the developer of the program. So there were things that the leadership team should be doing. There was a college and career counseling team. Um, there was a learning resources team that was providing professional development and offering courses through distance and online technology. They were also expanding college level courses like AP classes and dual enrollment. And they were providing resources and services to um, support and expand infrastructure capacity. So creating um, and maintaining online student learning information systems. And so all of these components together were intended to make several different changes to the high school instructional environment, to the school and motivational environment, um, changes in the classroom, and changes in the relationship between the community and the school. 
And then the ultimate goal of the program was to improve student outcomes like their college readiness as measured by their score on the ACT, um, increased advanced placement participation and performance on the AP exam, increased college enrollment and increased college persistence. So this analysis used propensity score matching, where the treatment group consisted of all students who were enrolled in schools that were participating in this college and career readiness consortium. And then the comparison group was students who were in a group of matched comparison schools in other regions of Tennessee that were similar to the schools that were involved within the consortium. And this shows the list of all the different variables that were used to match the schools for the comparison group. So there were demographic characteristics of the student population. There were test scores of the student population, including prior three-year averages on the ACT scores, which was one of the outcomes of the study. Um, there was information on the school's attendance and graduation rates, school resources like student-teacher ratios and total expenditures per pupil, um, community characteristics like the percent of population with a college degree, and whether or not it was a rural school and distance to the nearest public college. And then also information on CTE and advanced placement course taking that occurred prior to the start of the grant. So these are our schools that were intended to serve similar populations of students that had similar resources available. Um, but one group was involved in this consortium where the other group just continued under business as usual conditions. So these are some figures that um, show from the impact analysis, the difference between the comparison schools and the consortium schools on four of the different outcomes that, that we looked at. And you can see that for the most part, the consortium schools perform pretty similarly to the comparison schools. Um, the one place where we see a small difference is when we look at outcomes uh, like college enrollment and college persistence. But this is only after several years of exposure to the consortium activities. So. By year four of the consortium, uh, the probability of enrolling in college was 60% for the comparison schools compared to 64.6% for the consortium. So it, it increased uh, college going rates by about four percentage points. And we can see also that college uh, persistence increased by a few percentage points after the third year of exposure to the consortium. This study also had a very detailed implementation analysis. So um, if we go back to the um, theory of action that was shown here, all of the items in that first main boxes as components, there were indicators to measure each of those. So for the leadership team, there were measures about how often the director can be in the advisory board. Um, for the college and career counselor team, there was information about the number of days per week the counselors spent in schools and the counselors kept logs of their activities to show what they were doing. And so this kind of drills down a little deeper to show you some of the sample fidelity metrics. So for the college and career readiness counselors, the first component for the implementation analysis was that counselors spent at least one day per week in the schools. And so we, we uh, talked with the developer of the program and came up with uh, what seemed like the expectations for low partial or full participation um, in, in the amount of time that counselors were spending within schools. And counselors kept these daily logs in Excel that we could use to see which schools they were going to and how much time they spent there. There was also a fidelity metric on the amount of time spent on core activities. And so from this log, the counselors uh, kept track of all of the activities they were doing within each school. And we could see the amount of time that was spent on different types of activities that they were supposed to be doing as part of the grant. And so this figure here shows us a summary of all of the uh, different components of the consortium. Uh, they're each shown here on a different uh, color on the bar charts here. And there's a separate uh, series of bar charts for each year of the grant. And you can see the yellow line that's going across the bars is whether or not the, the consortium was perceived to be implemented with fidelity, which would be a measure of 2.5 or higher on, on a three point scale. And sometimes it's really difficult to figure out, like these are, these are kind of subjective measures. So what is really a high level of fidelity? And this, in, in order to come up with these uh, numbers, it's really important to have uh, conversations with the people who developed the program or the intervention to understand what their expectations are for it and what they think is necessary in order for the program to succeed. 
And so the third example that I'll show you today is from the Florida College and Career Readiness Initiative, which was funded through a grant through the U.S. Department of Education's Institute of Education Sciences. So the theory of action for this study was that there are students who in 10th grade can take a test that shows that they are low performing students. And then those students are assigned in 11th grade to take a college readiness assessment to further determine their, whether or not they're making progress to becoming ready for college level work. And then students who score below college ready on those assessments would be assigned in 12th grade to a college readiness and success course in English and or math. And these courses were designed to be similar to developmental education or remedial courses that are offered at community colleges. But the intent was that students could take these courses when they were still in high school in grade 12, and then hopefully improve their level of college readiness so that by the time they graduate and go on to college, they're ready to uh, successfully enter a college level course. And for the impact analysis of this study, we used a regression discontinuity design. And so the treatment group consisted of students who were scoring just above college ready on the placement test. So those students, if they scored above college ready in uh, 12th grade, they would take whatever math or English course that they initially planned on taking. For English, this was traditionally English 4. Um, for math, for many of these students who are lower performing, it was Algebra 2 it was the class that they would typically take in 12th grade. And the control group was students who scored just below college ready on the placement test. And so these students who just narrowly missed that margin would be assigned to these uh, college readiness and success courses in math and English that were designed to uh, be more re remedial in nature and review uh, basic skills that students need before entering college level work. And so all of these students should be pretty similar in terms of other characteristics. The only difference is that one scored just a few points higher than the other, so they should have pretty similar levels of academic achievement. The main difference being that some were assigned to a college readiness course and some were assigned to a typical 12th grade course in math or English. And so these graphs here um, look at uh, whether or not there's an impact of the, of the policy on the likelihood that students would take and pass um, non-developmental education courses in math or in English during their first year of college. And if you look on the um, horizontal axis, the label is the, the student's score on the 11th grade placement test in math or in reading. And so if the if the program was effective, what we would expect to see is a, a big shift right on that line of where the college readiness cutoff occurs, that we would have the likelihood of, of passing the college level class um, go up a little bit as the PERT scores increased. But then once you hit the college ready cutoff, you would see a big jump in the percentage of students uh, taking and passing non-developmental courses if the policy was effective, because that those would be the students that were assigned to take the, um, the college readiness course. And you can see here that the, the lines are pretty straight. There's you know, a, a little difference at the college readiness cutoff, which is the horizontal line that you see here. But overall, um, the, the results tend to be pretty similar for students scoring just above or just below college ready. This study also included a cost analysis to look at how much the intervention costs to implement throughout the state. And typically when this is done, there is a, a process called the ingredients method, where you, you consider all of the different types of ingredients that go into uh, funding and intervention. So the typical categories for that would be personnel cost. Um, in this case, that included st statewide and district-wide administrators of the uh, college placement test. It included uh, professional development providers for the teachers of the college readiness courses. It included um, district development of pacing guides and other curriculum materials. So the, the, the time that was spent um, by different teachers and educational leaders and administrators throughout the state in implementing the program. The next set of ingredients was materials and equipment. And this included things like textbooks and other purchased curricular materials like software, um, it included any type of new computer lab equipment schools needed, um, types of mailings that uh, schools sent out to students and their parents about the placement test, and also the, the cost of the test licenses for each of the students in the, in the program. And then the last main group of costs was based on facilities. And most of this was about district facilities that were used for, 
for professional development, but it also included the school computer lab space for the administration of the placement test. And you can see here, we categorize all of these different costs and according to the, the costs that were incurred at the state level, the costs that were incurred at the district level, and the costs that were incurred at the school level. And you can see from the figure here that the vast majority of the costs were incurred at the school level. Another part of the cost analysis was looking at how much of that money was um, originally allocated through special funding for this initiative, and how much of it was they were just reallocating resources that had previously gone to something else. And what we found that the total cost of the grant uh, for one year was approximately $7 million. And only $150,000 of that came from new funding that was set aside from the state. The remaining $7.15 million of that was all funding that schools and districts had to figure out how to reallocate their staff from the existing things that they were currently doing. And then we also found, we also separated the costs according to the initial startup cost of implementing the program versus the annual costs that are ongoing and continue in each year of the program. And we looked at how that was split up uh, again across the, distri the district, the state and the school level. And we found that the, the total cost of implementing the program in terms of ongoing and recurring costs was about $50, $57 per student per year. Again, with the majority of the cost, 63% being incurred at the school level. Um, so the last thing I'd like to do is share with you some types of resources that you can go to get some additional information as you are preparing these types of evaluations. And all of the examples that I'm showing here are from the US Department of Education, but there's probably a lot of information here that would also be relevant to um, other grant categories as well. So for impact evaluations, a great resource is the What Works Clearinghouse. And this is a set of standards that has been established by the US Department of Education to determine the level of rigor of different research designs. And they have very clear guidelines about um, how you should be designing studies, looking at the impact of different programs and policies, as well as reporting that information. And many of the, the grants that are submitted to the US Department of Education are required to provide an impact evaluation design that will meet what's called What Works Clearinghouse Standards. And that would mean that you follow all of the guidelines in this handbook when you were thinking about things like how you were going to recruit schools for participating in your study or um, deciding how you're going to handle students that switch from a treatment condition to a comparison uh, group condition. And people who review these types of grants spend a lot of time uh, Many of them are, are what works clearinghouse certified reviewers. And so as they go through and they read these applications, they think about, is this study rigorous enough and is it going to meet these what works clearinghouse standards? And so if, if your study doesn't do that, it will be at a disadvantage to the ones that do. Within the What Works Clearinghouse uh, website, they also have a page on resources for study authors, which has things like this reporting guide. And so this breaks down for each component of your study what they want to see included in an impact evaluation. So you can see at the bottom here, it shows the table one for the intervention, the comparison conditions. It provides a checklist of all the things that the What Works Clearinghouse looks for as they review different types of studies, looking at uh, the impacts of different programs or policies in education. Um, another great resource from the U.S. Department of Education is the Standards for Excellence in Education Research, or SEER. And these are kind of best practices in terms of conducting evaluations. And one of the areas that they focus on is implementation analyses. And so they include some recommended readings and um, different webinars and things that you can click on to go to to get more information about designing an implementation study. And then for cost analysis, there is a Center for Cost Analysis and Practice, or CAP, from Columbia University. And this, is, this was initially funded um, through a grant from the Institute of Education Sciences at the US Department of Education. And they provide really extensive resources about how to do cost analysis. Because one of the things that the US Department of Education found is that they were making this a requirement in many grants, but that people applying for these didn't have experience doing cost analysis before. And so they've provided a lot of training, both in person um, at Columbia University, at different conferences across the US, 
And they've also made a lot of their resources available online. There's different webinars that you can watch. There's um, reports and other resources that you can read. But one in particular that, that's very helpful is um, this report right here, which is a national database of uh, prices and educational resources. And this is, is a giant database that they have compiled that has all different types of costs that are um, in K-12 and post-secondary education. So at the beginning of this table here, it shows the category of ingredient is personnel. And then within that, you have academic advisors or counselors. And then you can sort further. Are you looking at K-12 education level or post-secondary education level? Are you looking at the public or private sector? Um, it includes a description of the typical role of somebody who's an academic advisor. And then it provides different prices broken down by an hourly rate or by calendar year, the cost of hiring an academic advisor or counselor. So if you're doing an intervention like the one that I discussed in, in Tennessee, that's a college and career readiness initiative, and there's new um, guidance counselors that are hired as part of that, you can estimate the cost of their time using nationally represented prices because the cost of a counselor in Tennessee might differ from the cost of a counselor in New York City. And this gives a national average of prices. So if you use these costs, it, it makes sure that uh, the results might be more comparable to other contexts outside of just the state of Tennessee. So that's the end of my prepared slide. And at this time, we would be happy to answer any questions that you have. I really appreciate all the resources that you covered. Those are fantastic. Thanks. Are there any questions? Anyone can just speak up. Can anyone provide um, some questions about where you are right now in your process? Are you developing? Are you thinking about? Or is it just far into the future? So where are you in your own process of maybe having to develop an evaluation? Okay, so that, yeah, go ahead, Christine. Did you see the question in the chat? I did, yeah. Okay. Um, so I was going to say the, the question is about what should an evaluation team consist of? And I think in part that depends on the size of the evaluation component of the grant. Sometimes that's the primary purpose of the grant, and it could be a multi million dollar grant where you have a large team of people. Other times it's a very small component of the overall project, and you might just have one evaluator for a project. But for a larger project, you would typically have separate uh, teams that are doing quantitative versus qualitative evaluation. So you might have one team that's going out and doing interviews and focus groups. Um, typically, we usually send at least two people to each interview and focus group. So you have one person to lead and ask, ask the questions and then another person who can follow up on anything that's unclear and take notes and handle uh, like making sure the recording's going on so that it's not overwhelming to the person doing the interviews. And then uh, typically there's a separate team that conducts the, the quantitative analysis, looking at the impact of the program. Um, again, depending on the, the size and the scope of the project, the number of people needed for that might differ. I don't know if you have any other thoughts on that, Dr. Turner. Yeah, I, was, I completely agree, and I love the idea of having two people in qualitative sessions, too. That's always been the best plan when I've done things like that. So yeah, it also depends on the kind of expertise that you need. So some of the things that um, Christine pointed out are sort of a higher, higher level statistical knowledge is required, and so you may need to have somebody who understands those things. I like the idea of having... Um, people who understand cost analysis, that's gonna be for a larger grant. Um, I do remember way back in my days at the Austin Independent School District, our um, leader made us dis, you know, calculate how many dollars were spent for each participant in a particular program way before they ever did cost analysis. And um, I found that really useful to give a broader overview of 
you know, yeah, this this program may be absolutely terrific, but it's if it's going to cost a gazillion dollars, is it really practical? Versus, wow, this is a moderate amount that this is replicable. You know, it really does help to make future decisions. So I appreciate that. So just I I would just add that it depends on the kinds of expertise that you need and what you're doing. I have a question. Um, so I I am right now working with faculty on NSF career, and there are broader there's a broader impact section, and then there's um, how you're incorporating it into your education. And sometimes people are just you know, are wondering, like, how, how do I know if this is going to work? And, and who can I ask to see, am I writing this correctly so that there can be checks at the end of this? Um, are, there, are there groups people can reach out to? Are there, there are people they can ask? That's a really good question. And I do not know that we have those kinds of resources. I do have some people who are developing NSF career grants who have contacted me. I've, I've talked to them about it. And of course, it depends on what they need. But I don't think that we provide really good resources the way that we do, say, for statistical analysis. You can you know, readily get um, help with that. We don't have, uh, at, at least as far as I know at this university, we don't currently have a group of program evaluation, you know, experts who can help people design that. For that, I would say, you know, developing a really good uh, theory of action, you know, trying to really articulate and be clear about what that will look like and making really you know, smart goals, specific, measurable, timely, that kind of thing, keeping those things in mind will go a long way in how they think about the design of their evaluation components. Thank you. So there's a question about how to become a program evaluator. Mm -hmm. um, so there is a program that's offered at FSU and the Department of Education Leadership and Policy Studies that is a graduate certificate in program evaluation. It's 15 credit hours. It's completely online and can be completed asynchronously. Um, some students complete it as a part of their master's or PhD programs, but it's also open to non-degree seeking students and employees throughout the university as well. So that's a great resource for people interested in learning more about program evaluation. Or even if you just want to take like the intro to program evaluation class and not do the whole sequence of the certificate, it would give you a, a good uh, kind of foundation for understanding program evaluation. Now, highly recommend it. I often uh, recommend that our own graduate students take those classes or get the certificate because it really um, gives you a different way of thinking. Uh, particularly uh, helping you be more clear um, about your theory of action and things like that. It, it, and to understand how can you get, you know, where, where can you put in pieces to get information to find out if everything's working well or not. Um, it really helps your thinking in that sense. I also added the link in the chat if anyone is interested in reading more about the program evaluation certificate. I appreciate you mentioning that. And um, I didn't even think about even mentioning to faculty members to take the intro, especially if it's asynchronous, would be a great mm -hmm. start to help people better understand how to address that portion of it. So thank you for mentioning that. Yeah. And they're great instructors. Um, my students highly recommend them. So, um, you know, please take the classes. So you don't have to get another degree. You can just take the introduction class and you may want to take maybe a second class depending on what your interests are, but you don't have to get the whole certificate. Are there any remaining questions? I will say there's other um, organizations uh, like the American Evaluation Association. It's a very large um, group 
and they um, often provide training in different um, locations around the country. So there are lots of different ways to get information about evaluation. And you had a question on whether or not you're going to do more of these sessions. Is that direct? I feel like that's directed to, get to you and Christine. <laughs> oh. you going to tell us more. Um, they're not planned, but maybe by popular demand, they'll be back. We'll see. <laughs> um, okay. If there if there are questions, um, don't hesitate to email Ord, and um, we can connect you with. Um, people and services that can help you with your program evaluation efforts. Um, I'll just go ahead and put that link in the chat. Um, and um, with that, I think we are we have wrapped this up. This this um, video recording will be available for everyone on the um, Ord YouTube channel. So if you need to go back and remember uh, some of the things that uh, Janine and Christine said, and thank you, Janine and Christine, so much. This was so uh, fascinating. Really appreciate it. <laughs>